Welcome to The Healthy Advisor, a podcast from wealthmanagement.com focused on advisors' personal well-being and healing. I'm Diana Britton, Managing Editor of wealthmanagement.com, and in this podcast, we explore some of the struggles and personal development issues facing advisors and financial services professionals, and how to get to a place of healing for mind, body, and spirit. Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of the Healthy Advisor podcast, and thanks for joining us. As you may know, this is the podcast focused on financial advisor health and wellness, and today's guest is currently on his own journey to achieving just that. Uh, His name is Jonathan Dio. He's a senior vice president at EP Wealth Advisors in Berkeley, California. Jonathan, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Diana. I'm excited for the conversation. Yeah, same here. So, um, so growing up in finance with uh, financial insecurity, today Jonathan seeks to help others attain the confidence of being on the path to having enough. Uh, his first book, Mindful Money, was published in 2017, and he's also the host of the Mindful Wealth Pod. Definitely a great one to check out. Um, but a little over a year ago, Jonathan was in a really healthy place. Um, was meditating, working out. Uh, eating and sleeping right, and then you know, sort of thrown into tragedy when he lost his only brother and business partner. Um, they were working on a, a new business venture when his brother David passed away. Um, and since then, you know, Jonathan Jonathan's sort of been on a journey to rebuild those healthy habits after experiencing these this huge loss. Um, you know, but this wasn't the first time he struggled to get a healthy lifestyle. And so we're going to talk about all that today on the podcast. And um, he's sort of going to open up about his experiences. Um, so, but Jonathan, let's start off. I mean, take us back a little bit, you know, and tell us about your childhood. I knew you grew up in in Rapid City, South Dakota. Um, and so what was that like? What was, uh, what was it like growing up there? Uh, so, so the, I mean, the reason we were in Rapid City, South Dakota is, is interesting. My, my dad actually worked for a, before I was born, my dad worked for a computer company in you know, Silicon Valley. This is back in the vacuum tube days uh, of computers. And he, they quit their job or he quit his job and, and he and my mom moved to Rapid City you know, to live in a small town, a safe place, a slower pace. Um, neighbors were all close. You know, the kids were all over the community. And, and just so, so that was my childhood. Like I was a kid and my childhood was outside camping, fishing, Boy Scouts, soccer, baseball, you know, all rec, not, not like today's competitive stuff. Mm-hmm. It was a pretty amazing place to grow up. That being said, when I was two, my, my parents' big business idea crashed. And there wasn't mm-hmm. really a steady income in my house until I was 15. My parents lost probably seven rental properties, eight, a bunch of rental properties, went back to the lender. We struggled financially my entire life. You know, I didn't get the cool dirt bike. I didn't get new skis. I didn't get, I got plastic soccer shoes from Payless. Um, you know, so, so I, I, I was raised with this desire for more desire for stuff because mm-hmm. I didn't have anything. But I loved it. Like I loved all the stuff I got to do. But I did, you know, my mom and I had lots of conversations in the last few years just about how sensitive I was to having to having less than my peers. And that that was that hurt. And that that carries forward to today. Mm. And so how did you ultimately get into the financial services industry? Uh <laughs> <laughs> circuitously. So if, if you, if people talk to me, you know, my friends in high school would have said that this is where I would have ended up. Um, they, they already knew this and maybe I already knew it as well. Um, perhaps because we didn't have anything, like I was fascinated with money and I was, I, you know, I was the kid in grade school, third grade who, who bought, you know, a pack of gum for, I guess, probably 20 cents then. And then, and then came to school and sold them for 25 cents a piece. Right. And so I, I was making money when I was six and seven and eight and in, in grade school. By the time I was nine and 10, I was reading value line research in um, a broker's office wow. in downtown rapid. So I ended up buying my first stock when I was nine or 10 years old. You know, it was first bank system. And it was, I think today it's part of Minneapolis state bank or a bank in Minneapolis, but uh, this was 1980. So just before the SNL crisis. So my first stock investment, I lost probably 50% of the, of the investment. I know probably invested a couple hundred bucks and that came out of it with a hundred bucks, something like that. 
But as a kid, I was very money motivated. I always was running my own business. I was always fascinated by the markets and, and I and I loved studying economics. My the only scholarship I got in college was from my high school economics club. You know, I got a five hundred dollars scholarship. Um, and I and I and I love studying economics. Um, and I started in college studying finance, mm-hmm. but got really bored really quickly. So I ended up changing majors. I I talked to my my favorite professor at the time was Dr. Allard, Jim Allard, and he was teaching my philosophy class. I went to office hours with him and I said, you know, what do you think about you know job possibilities or or what do you think about majoring in philosophy and religious studies? And with his support and with support of a couple other professors, I ended up shifting from finance, which was the likely long-term goal, likely long-term job prospect for me, to philosophy and religious studies. I came to ended up coming to uh, Berkeley to study at the Graduate Theological Union. I came, I started out as a Lutheran seminarian. I switched to sort of Buddhist academia. And at that time, my first wife, who had been supporting me through grad school, said it was her turn to go to grad school. And so I dropped out of a program in Buddhist studies. Now, you know, dropping out from Buddhist studies... (laughs) There's there's no there's no job track for that. Uh, Where so do you I kinda, go from there? Yeah. Exactly, no <laughs> place to go. So I went I went to I applied at Dean Witter and Dean Witter was hiring for sales and I became you know I became a broker and that's that's how I got into um, the financial services world and I was there I was on Wall Street firms a variety of Wall Street firms learning lots of different lessons from I think that's 1996 to maybe 2001. Hmm. And Dean Witter, they have a really good reputation, right? A, a very good culture. And I don't know, what was the culture like there? So, I mean, this is, Dean Witter doesn't exist anymore. Dean Witter right, yeah. um, became, you know, many of the transitions I made were voluntary, but many of them were involuntary. You know, I think I think if you count them all up, I was at seven firms in five years, but three or four of those were because of mergers. So I, I interviewed at Dean Witter and, and my Dean Witter office was at a low rise building in downtown San Francisco. And probably three months in, Morgan Stanley purchased Dean Witter. Mm. And Morgan Stanley was there, that's a high rise top floor, you know, you know, very, very posh, you know, place. And so we moved to their offices um, very quickly. And we're talking, you know, I went from a brick building to a glass building. I went from you know, I wore a suit in both places, but the the energy level was different in both places. Dean Witter was once owned by Sears, and you kind of get that kind of a feel from mm. from how they operate with with clients and with people and with community. Morgan Stanley is Wall Street. You know, it's 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 venture capital, it's IPO, it's it's that world, uh, and it's totally different. Um, I used to have the manager at. Uh, at Morgan Stanley, we called him the Ice Man. I think I, I don't even remember what his real name was, but he used to walk through the, he used to walk through the office, and he'd come directly to my cubicle. You know, and he's he runs the San Francisco office, which is probably the second largest office in the in the system. And I'm you know a one you know six months in trainee, right? I'm brand new, and he's telling me how I'm supposed to be placing these these new mutual funds manufactured by Dean Witter into our clients' accounts and then what, my, what I'm responsible for and what I have to do. And so it was like very pressure. You, you sell this now. Um, this is mm. what you have to do. Um, that was one of those you know, early lessons uh, and, and totally not a fan of Wall Street. And, and so right around, I did, there was Dean Witter becomes Morgan Stanley, Dean Witter. I moved to Payne Weber. Payne Weber becomes UBS Payne Weber. It drops uh, the Payne Weber moniker. I moved to Smith Barney. I don't last there very long at all. Uh, I moved to Prudential. That becomes Wachovia Prudential. So it or becomes Wachovia. They drop Prudential altogether. So lots and lots and lots of changes. Uh, ultimately, lots of lessons, lots of changes, ultimately leading to 2001, where I started my own firm. Yeah. I mean, can you tell us a little bit about how your lifestyle and habits changed when you were on Wall Street? Y- yeah. So before, when I was in grad school, like I would bike five hours, five hours, five miles to and from class. You know, my, where I lived was in Emeryville. I went to school in um, Berkeley and, and I would bike both sometimes twice a day. I would bike to and from uh, school. I was in great shape. So I, I'm six foot five. So you can kind of, you know, get, get a sense of, of body fat percentage by saying, okay, I weighed about 200 pounds when I started. And, and by the time 2006 rolls around, I'm in I guess that's 10 years. 
I was up to about 290 pounds. Mm. When you're in a Wall Street firm, you know, their their goal is to sell product. So the the people that would host lunch, they would host pizza, there'd be cocktails, there's you know, beer afterwards. Uh, I was a big fan of ice cream and I I didn't uh, I didn't not partake. I, I partook of every lunch, every everything that every hosted thing that occurred. And then wholesalers would come to subgroups of people and they'd say, all right, we're going to take you six brokers out. Uh, and we went out and we'd go, you know, it, just debauchery. It was the, the things you watch in, in movies were kind of how it happened. And I didn't get into the drugs or any of that, but a lot of alcohol, lots mm-hmm. of, lots of food and no exercise. Cause you get up at five in the morning to get to work by, by six to get your paperwork done. So you can start cold calling at eight and then you cold call from eight until probably 6 PM. Um, oh my gosh, may, wow. Maybe you take a break at noon for lunch. Maybe you don't do some paperwork, go home. And so I worked, you know, 12, 14 hours a day for six days a week uh, for probably three, four, five years. And obviously really bad food, no exercise, poor sleep, lots of alcohol, not enough water. It made perfect sense that I ballooned to 290 pounds uh, and fits and starts. You know, I, I was like, oh my God, I'm out of control here. I got to get control of this. And then another invitation to another party or another thing. And, and I would, I would, I would do it. And not everyone did it. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying wall street's evil for that reason. That's my choice, but I, I chose poorly and ended up in a bad place. Yeah. I mean, you know, when you're sitting at the desk, so, so many hours, it's, it's hard to build healthy, the uh, healthy habits. What was sort of the wake up call that motivated you to change your lifestyle at that point? So there, there was a, there was one specific wake up call. Um, but, but on the way to that wake up call, there were threads, there were little, you know, I had a friend of mine who said, Hey, you know, let's join the gym together. And we'd go to the gym and we'd do some workouts and, and that was helpful. But if you're constantly still miss, you know, eating poorly and, and drinking too much, just having a workout, is not going to do it. So mm-hmm. what, what ended up happening was I was skiing and, um, I had forgotten my ski pants and this is, I don't remember what year this is, 2006, 2007, something like that. Oh, it had to be 2000. Yeah. It had to be 2007 because my son was two and a half. I had a, I had a second child on the way and uh, we were going skiing and my parents were coming up with us and, and I forgot my ski pants and my dad said, Hey, just try mine. My dad's a pretty big guy. He's a little shorter than I am, but he's definitely wider than I am. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I, put the pants on. I, you know, I kind of giggled to myself. There's no way these are going to fit. And I put them on and they were, they were tight. I write about this. I write about the whole story in my book as a sort of a, the, the intro to recapturing my health. Um, mm. And it was a wake up call. Doesn't mean it changed right away. Doesn't mean that, you know, I went home that day and, and fixed the problem. Didn't happen that way at all. But uh, I, I did say, you know what, this is a problem. This is getting out of control. I have to do something about it. Yeah. Um, so what did you do about it? How did you go about getting healthy? It's pro- probably, I don't know, six months. I actually don't know how much later, but I was, you know, watching late night TV, probably had a drink in my hand and P90X came on and I was like, you know what, what the hell let's, let's give it a shot. You know, I've been talking about this. I know it's a problem. It's something I want to do. And so I, I ordered P90X and, um, you know, in the next probably 10 years, I ordered a whole bunch of these different programs, but P90X was the one that got me launched. And, you know, what is you, P90X? Can you P90X? It? Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's one of these workout programs you see at late night TV where there's, there's a guy, I think his name was Tony Horton and he's jumping up and down and he's lifting, you know, dumbbells and there's three people behind him, uh, you know, different levels of fitness. And they're just, they're just doing this. They're just doing this program. The program is like, it's high intensity interval training. And so, um, you know, one day it's, it's back and by the next day it's cardio. The next day it's, it's, um, um, chest and chest and legs, or, you know, I don't remember what the breakups were, but it's just this every single day you have a DVD, you pop the DVD into your computer or your, you know, DVD player, and you just watch it and do what they're doing. And in the, in the beginning, uh, stages, you know, I'm at, I'm at 290 pounds. They're about, they're 45 minutes to an hour and 15 minutes each. I'd make it five minutes before I'd pass out. I, like I couldn't, I couldn't do five minutes. I couldn't do 10 minutes, but mm-hmm. I, I never stopped. I just kept putting it in 
kept putting the DVD in, kept hitting play. I'd go for my 10 minutes. I'd be a sweaty mess, uh, you know, lay down and try to breathe for a while. And then the next day I'd put the next DVD in and, and do it. The interesting thing that happened for me was the fact that I was hurting myself doing P90X cleaned up my diet. Like I, why would I work at cross purposes? Cause this sucked horribly. This was so hard. This was painful. This, this was no fun. So I could stop doing that and just go straight back to pizza and pizza and beer, or right. I could keep going forward with this and I could maybe get healthy again. And what I started noticing, and this is probably after a couple months of, of battling it, I started noticing my flexibility was improving. My um, energy level was up. I noticed that uh, my strength was up. I could last you know, 30 minutes of the 45 minute workout. I started feeling better about myself. And so, you know, I kept, I kept powering forward. I've never gotten back down to 200 ever in my life, but I did get back down to 220. I do think that the, you know, the, the health is not all about weight. So I, I think that I was healthier at 220 than I was at 200. Um, you know, I wasn't as skinny, but I had mus, you know, my musculature was, I was much stronger. I could, I could do more things. That wasn't just all one, one muscle group. It was, it was the entire body. It was every everything in the package was improved by cleaning up the diet, by drinking less and by just, just hitting play on the DVD. And by the way, you know, since then I've tried so many different programs and there's so much free stuff on YouTube. One, you don't have to buy the thing or subscribe or become a member of Beachbody or, jo or join P90X or anything like that. This stuff is free. The high intensity interval training is available. Um, you just have to go to YouTube and look up 30 minute workout and they'll find, you can find you know, 50 different options, find the one that works for you. Yeah, sure. That's great. Um, so had you started your own firm by that time when you started getting healthy? Yeah. So this is my, I started my firm in 2001, end of 2001, early 2002. So I was okay. probably five years, uh, five years into my firm. And, and I think I had, I think I had stopped, you know, and started my own firm, the hours didn't go down, but the level of alcohol intake went down. The level of peace intake went down because I wasn't, I wasn't in an office where that stuff was just around all the time. Um, and right, so yeah. some of the, some of the life and I was, I was married and, and, and Kate is, you know, Kate, you know, these people influence us. And my wife, Kate is, she is healthy and she puts her health first and she eats very, very well. So it was really easy to kind of adopt or at least partially adopt some of those habits, um, with her didn't, didn't lose the weight, didn't take it off until I started doing P90X. Yeah. That's, that's really important to have a partner on board. So take us back to, to last summer. What happened to your brother? I know that was sort of a, yeah, you know, just a tragedy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so where I guess, I guess from the time of getting healthy to this is probably 14, maybe 15 years. Mm. And and so in that time I had developed just an incredible dedicated, you know, morning routine and all right, I'll just say it. My, 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 my brother drowned uh, on June 17th in the Pacific ocean, just South of Santa Cruz. And, you know, my life basically came to a screeching halt the next day um, or that day, you know, when, when Judy called up and said, you know, Hey, there's a problem. Uh, I can't tell you right now. I got to go. And I was like, Oh my God, what happened? And then she called back 10 minutes and they said, they said they were bringing Dave in from the water and he wasn't breathing and she was going to go to the hospital and she'd call me from the hospital. So I sat on that for a little bit longer and, um, you know, just, I was just screaming. Like I was alone in my house and I was just like, I, you know, he's not breathing. They brought him in from the beach, you know, you know, I didn't know what was going to happen. He's going to the hospital. You know, there's a little bit of hope, but not much. So I just was, um, I, I fell apart right then and there. I mm -hmm. called my wife and said, Hey, this is what's going on. Can you, can you, can you get home? She was on a hike. She lost it and she was screaming. I said, I can't deal with this right now. And so I, I hung up on her and just went back to being alone. I got the call back from Judy. Um, and, and she said, uh, yeah, Dave, Dave didn't make it. And, oh um, and, you know, the next, I don't know, two or three weeks I tried to, well, I, you know, I, I let people in the office know I'm not, I'm not coming in tomorrow. And in fact, you know, clear out, clear out my schedule for the rest of the week. And, you know, I call them up on, 
the next Monday and said, yeah, I better, better clear out the schedule for this week too. And then I called mm-hmm. them up the next Monday and said, Hey, you, you may as well clear out the schedule for the next, next two weeks as well. And I just didn't go to work for a month. Uh, and I, I started out handling it by myself. I went downstairs, my, you know, we're all working from home at this point. And so I had this office downstairs and my, my workout stuff's in the office, my, my desk and books and everything is in the office. So I just come downstairs when I woke up before everyone else woke up and I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't work out. I didn't meditate. I tried to sit down. I tried to meditate. Um, I just, I just couldn't, I couldn't calm down. Like I, my mind was just going, 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 you know, doing the, doing the standard, I guess, uh, Elizabeth Kuba Ross you know, stages of grief, you know, denial, you know, spend a lot of time just walking around my neighborhood, yelling, um, just sitting in my basement crying. Um, and I tried really hard to handle it by myself. I'd, you know, cry alone for hours. And then finally I had a, you know, I had my, I don't know, which an anxiety attack or a panic attack. First one I've ever had. And then I just kind of realized that I, just, I wasn't going to be able to do this on my own. I asked for help and mm-hmm. said, Hey, um, to Kate and, and my kids, I'm a mess. Uh, it'd be great if every now and then y'all would come down and check on me because I'm, I'm literally just, just hanging out on my own by myself and not being able to focus, not really doing anything, just, just sitting and crying for hours and hours and hours. Mm. Yeah, I know. You know, I know, uh, you know, you and I were talking, there's, there's not a lot of support for, um, folks going through death of a sibling, um, you know, right. and, and it's, it's such a unique, um, relationship in your life. I mean, it's, um, you know, somebody that has that sort of shared experience uh, of growing up with you, you know, it's m- more difficult than in a lot of ways to deal with. Um, so how did you sort of, what made you kind of realize that you needed help and, and you asked for it? I know that you, um, you know, you were telling me that you're sort of always the one helping other people. And, um, you know, I'm sure what, you know, obviously with your clients, that's what you do on a daily basis, um, you know, help folks navigate their financial life. Um, so how did you sort of get to that point where, where you could ask others? Well, okay. So, so, um, yeah, I, I, I'm always the one, and this is true with friends. It's true with clients. I like to be, I guess today we call it toxic uh, masculinity about being tough. Um, and I've never been, I've never been one to hide tears, but I've also never been one to seek help. Uh, I've always, I've always um, tried to be there for other people when they need help. And I've tried to, you know, help my family and, and I've tried to help friends and I'm trying to be, you know, uh, available. But I mean, it was pretty obvious w- when all you do, is cry and all you do is is melt down and and you spend when you spend hours there and you know i i found myself wishing it was me and i found myself there's this there's this um, the human brain does this worst case scenario thing and does this does this think of the negative and projects the negative into the future and and i'm always going to be here and i'm never going to feel better and and this is very normal. And I know how this all works. I've been meditating for 20 years. I've, you know, I know how to calm myself. I know how to do all these things. So I, I understand all the academics behind it. I understand the brain science behind it, but going through it and, you know, I, I did wish it was me. I started wondering if I was going to make it. Uh, and this translates into, you know, if you bring this up to other people, you're going to be a burden on them. They're going to leave you just like he left you. Hmm. And um, you know, and there's, there's moments where you, where you just, you want it, you want it to end. I'm, you want the pain to go away. Mm. And then, you know, you have to tell somebody. Mm. And so I did. And, uh, it was, it was amazing to me, you know, I believe going in or I believed going in that I was supposed to bear the burden of it myself, that I was supposed to not make other people hurt or see the pain or whatever. But what I learned was, you know, my family obviously really wants to help. They're close. They, they get it. 
they're here, they're living it with me. They may, maybe, maybe they weren't uh, aside from my parents, you know, my wife and kids weren't as close to Dave mm -hmm. um, as I was, but, but you know, they, they all, they get it. But by, you know, having this conversation, but for the last year and starting probably a month after he died, I started just being really open about it. I, and I, and I had, you know, a month, a month after he died, I had client meetings and one of my best friends, I, I brought one of my best friends into the firm three years ago, Scott, four years ago, like it's probably five years ago now. I mean, COVID's got me all backwards in time, Yeah. <laughs> um, but Scott, Scott joined the firm and, you know, Scott was like a brother to me. Um, and I, and, and when I say that today, it's different than when I said that, said that three years ago. And I was with, you know, we're on a, on a call with a client, Scott's on the call with me, um, introducing Scott to, to this relationship um, with this client. And I say to Scott and to the client, you know, Scott's like a brother to me. And immediately, like no warning at all, I just start crying and fall apart. And I spend, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm on Zoom, right? So I, I um, mute myself and I, and I start working through this whole, this whole thing. Um, and Scott just carries on a conversation with them with, with me muted, um, you know, bawling, heaving on this, on this, on the call. Um, so a couple of things I learned about that w one clients got it. They understood why I wasn't there for a month. They understood why I was introducing Scott to the conversation. Um, they were lovely. Uh, and, and my clients were amazing and supportive and, uh, and wonderful. And any reference to my brother would, would basically be a trigger or to a brother or to being like a brother or, you know, mm -hmm. would just, would just, would just take me back and, and, and bury me. And, th and that still happens. Like when I, if I, if I catch myself saying something like that today, I will immediately think of Dave. Now we're 13 months after, and I still miss him obviously. And he's still in my heart and I still think about him all the time. But the, but the, from trigger to complete meltdown doesn't occur quite as quickly. It's not a surprise. And it's part of that's because I'm not pushing back on it so hard. Part of it's because um, I'm more open with it. I have been more open with it. I'm more able to talk about it. And it still brings tears to my eyes. Um, it's still something that's important, but it's now shared. And by sharing it, um, the burden is still largely mine, but I, I feel like there's community. I feel supported. I feel really good about it. And just, a, just one quick story. I have this, I have this client who they're just, they're great people. I've known them for, you know, 15 years. They're just lovely people. And, and literally no, didn't ask for it. Didn't say a thing about it. Um, she heard about it. She started, she walks her dog in, in Berkeley. And she started when she was on a walk, taking a picture of you know, uh, you know, a kid might have drawn a heart in chalk on the on the sidewalk, and she took a picture of that drawn heart on the sidewalk, and she texted to me. And for like three months, I'd get one or two of those a day. And then today, this morning, this is thirteen months later, I got a I got a text with her from her with a heart in it today. Mm. And so, being open, it just you know, invite people in to the good and the bad. They're supportive. They're fantastic. People aren't afraid of this. They don't know what to say always, right? Because it's, what do you say? I don't know what to say. Um, but they love you and, and, and they want to be helpful. And that's helpful <laughs> in and of itself. Mm. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, we talk about um, healing a lot on this podcast and, you know, the, the cold, hard truth of it is, you know, I don't know if you ever heal from something like this, you know, no. and, um, uh, but, but I, you know, really appreciate you sharing, um, you know, at least how you found some support through that. So, you know, I know that, you know, some of your habits sort of broke down in the last year and, and that's for obvious reasons. Um, but how have you sort of started rebuilding those habits in the last, um, couple months? So the anchor, I mean, how do you rebuild any habit, right? If you, if you, um, or I guess there's lots of theories on this, how I've done it in the past is I've, as I've tied it with a prior habit, right? So if, if I wanted to, 
if I wanted to meditate daily, I would tie meditation with, you know, that's the first thing I do when I get out of bed. So when I wake up, I meditate. Right. Um, mm. And so for me, basically all of my morning habits were gone and I, and I, you know, I return to some of those bad habits of staying up too late and drinking too much and, 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 um, you know, watching stupid TV. And then, and then in the morning I would get up, but I wouldn't get out of bed. I just, I'd flip through stupid Facebook, whatever videos and, and those kinds of things, YouTube stuff. And I, and I just got, I got stuck there and I was stuck there for a long time. So what I decided to do was, this is probably five months ago now. Um, I decided that I was going to, I was going to build an anchor and I was going to start with meditation. I was going to make meditation my anchor and I was going to build my other habits onto that anchor habit. And I tried to sit, I sat and I couldn't do it. And my brain would still go crazy and I couldn't sit still. And I just would sit down and cry immediately or, and, and so that wasn't going to work. So what I did is I signed up for a retreat and one of the, one of the people I've followed for a long time is Tara Brock and Tara talks about trauma. She talks about loss and she talks about grieving. And, um, and so I, I found, uh, she was involved in a live, in other words, in person on land, you know, people coming together, um, retreat called the um, power of awareness. And it was, it was hosted two weeks ago, three weeks ago. And so I signed up for it a couple months ago and I, and I went, um, and when I went down there, like, I didn't know anybody, I didn't know anyone there. I've never done this before. I haven't been this. I call this sort of sort of pop pop meditation. You know, it's, it's not the stuff that I learned when I was at the Institute of Buddhist studies and I was working with monks and I was, you know, I, I went to the, to the Berkeley um, Zen center on a, on a daily basis. Like it wasn't that this is, this is a bunch of Westerners who studied under these, those people and, and sort of modified the teachings to be more secular. Mm. No problem with that at all, but I, I'd never done this before. And so when I went, I was in a, I was in a group of people that I've never been among before. Um, um, they weren't academic students of the discipline of meditation. They were what turns out exactly what I needed. Like this wasn't the first day I learned this, but by the third day I had met, you know, a woman who, whose husband had committed suicide. I had met uh, people who had lost parents. I had met people, who, many, many people who are going through divorce, many people who'd lost, um, you know, their best friend and just so many people dealing with stuff. And so every little group conversation or session that we had, there was like an outpouring of, oh my gosh, I'm sorry that happened to you, to me. And at the same time, to three other people in the group I was in, it was weird at first because people were there in couples, there were people there with friends and I was there alone. So I had a hard time meeting people and chatting with people, but I, sitting in the classes and, and sitting with meditation instruction and just, and just sitting, I got what I needed out of it. And that was when I came back, I was able to sit. So, you know, at one of these retreats, you get up at 6.45 in the morning and you go do a yoga stretch kind of a thing with one teacher, and then you go have breakfast. And then at nine o'clock session start. And so from nine o'clock AM to nine o'clock PM, you'd either be in session, meaning you'd be getting meditation instructions or you'd be meditating, or you'd be at a meal. And so it was 12 hours a day for five days of meditation and meditation instruction. Uh, and those meals were social where you talk to people and you'd learn about other people that were suffering. And not everyone is suffering. Some people are, are there to learn how to teach. Some people are there for whatever reason, but I got exactly what I needed. I reestablished the practice. And so when I came back, this is two weeks ago now, uh, I sat the very next day for 30 minutes and I sat the next day after that for 30 minutes. And I sat the next day after that for 30 minutes. And so that the habit of meditation is there. And so now I'm working to bolt on, um, working out and mm -hmm. right now that's fits and starts. You know, I, uh, I try to either do some kind of, um, resistance training or go for a long walk, uh, every single day. And I'm probably at five, four to five days a week of being successful at that. You know, this morning, I think perhaps anticipation in anticipation of talking about this, I didn't get out of bed. Like I, I didn't get out of bed in time. And so I did my meditation, but I didn't have enough time then to um, get a workout in before I started working. But ultimately fast forward 
you know, with a little luck, three months, I'll have, I'll have those habits built, uh, built up again. I, I will meditate. I will work out. I will cool off. As I cool off, I will read and write. And hopefully that's an everyday thing. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a journey, right? It's not, it's not a, it's, there's no sil- silver bullet. Uh, right. You know, it's not going to happen overnight. Um, so, I mean, I know that we're, we're running out of time here, but I wanted to, I wanted you to talk just a little bit about, um, you know, sort of the work that you're doing now and sort of how, um, you know, I know you were working on a, a joint venture with your brother, um, you know, prior to his passing. Um, and that sort of has, has led you to, to where you are now. Um, and um, so sort of tell us about what led you to, to merge with EP Wealth and, and do the work that you're doing now. Yeah. Yeah. So for, for years and years and years and years, my brother and I have been talking about coming together to, to work on not wealth management, but on financial education and, and um, so broadening the impact, you know, I've worked for 25 years now with, with people that already have money. And I worked at, um, you know, growing the money that they have, helping them pass on to the next generation and do that kind of stuff. You know, standard financial advisor work. Mm-hmm. He has worked in a technology space on things that have um, lower revenue per transaction, but but reach many, many, many more people. And he's worked in credit space, the debit space, the the um, the mortgage lending space, uh, and and the 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 ways that he did outreach would enable, um, I think, I thought we thought together. Uh, the ability to provide financial education on a much broader scale for a much lower price. Mm-hmm. And for the last 15 years, the practice I've run has basically been driven on, you know, what is it can, what, what can an advisor do? An advisor can plan and educate. A, an advisor can help people plan and educate. I, I don't believe in, you know, our ability to time the market or predict the future relative performance of investments. I, I just have never believed in that. Well, that's not true. Early in, when I was at Wall Street, I did believe in that, but I, I sort of shocked myself out of that belief by screwing up a whole bunch of times. Mm-hmm. Um, but so I think with education and with planning, you know, we can help people. I was going to take, we were going to take that education and planning message and broaden it out and have a greater impact with many, many more people, you know, sort of open up the advisory world to help people that don't have access to advisors, um, mm. you know, lower net worth people, people um, coming, coming back after a, a health scare or losing a job or, or whatever it might be. And, and we had actually started a company in 2006 to do this, but we had to mothball that company because we both had little kids who didn't have time to do it. Um, and we were getting to this point where, and in, in 2018, 19, I was, I, you know, I'm not a technologist. I'm not an HR professional. I'm actually not even a CEO. I'm an advisor. So I work really well with clients. I'm not as good at all the business stuff. He's got an MBA. He had an MBA from Cal. And so we had this, we were going to do it once his last vesting, his, you know, his last tranche of stock invest, uh, vested. And that was March of 21. Uh, and so it vested, all right, let's, let's figure out these details. Well, you're going to come on, you know, Dave's going to come on as a CEO. He's going to handle HR. He's going to handle operations. He's going to handle all of these things. Um, but we never get there because in June of 21, he dies. And so he dies June of 21. I take a month, just, you know, I'm not doing anything. Um, I, I realize that I'm never going to be able to do, put in the time and effort and energy that I put in, you know, before he died in doing the same job that I was doing before. I realized that I have to find uh, some place that'll take HR technology operations off my plate. Mm-hmm. Um, my, my brain's not in it. I don't have the same focus. I don't have the same uh, ability. And I have the desire to do the podcast and to do more writing. And I'm on my, I'm writing my second book and I'm, and I'm, so I have the desire to do all these things but I don't have the capacity. So I have to offload some of the, some of the work of business management. And I had talked to EP three, four years ago. Um, at that point, it wasn't a good fit because they wanted me to move to Walnut Creek. I'm not moving to Walnut Creek. I'm in Berkeley. I'm a Berkeley person. That's a different kind of people. That's a different, that's a different, you know, personality type entirely, uh, Berkeley yeah. and Walnut Creek. So uh, I went back to them and said, 
you know, this is, this is where I'm at now. What do you guys think? You know, Berkeley office, you know, I could be your Berkeley office, et cetera. Uh, and at the same time, I hired an m a firm. They introduced me to 15 other companies that I could talk to. I talked to six of them very, very seriously. And by the end of 21, I had, I had made the decision and I'd completed the merger with EP. Um, and so today, you know, I guess three months after that. So by March of 2022, I had launched my second podcast, the Mindful Money Podcast. I've been doing the Mindful Wealth Podcast for a while, but the Mindful Money Podcast is sort of, that's the vision that he and I had together. This is this is education. This is simple stuff um, uh, that most people maybe don't have access to or the questions that are hard to answer that, that help people focus on the decisions they should be focused on rather than focus on the stuff that the financial press or, or, or um, no, not that they're all bad, but a lot of it is self, you know, self-interested um, and the product manufacturers are trying to tell people to think about. And so, so I'm able to do it. I'll never have the scale. I'll never have the reach that I would have had with him, but I can actually take some of that message and package it in a different way and offer it out there to the world. And to those people that are takers, you know, uh, I'm, I'm excited to offer it and I'm excited to be doing it at the same time. I really like working with my clients and I'm really glad to have a home for them that gives me the support uh, and offloads and takes care of some of that stuff that I'm not, A, I'm not good at, B, I don't have fun with. Yeah, well, that's that's great that you're able to, you know, sort of honor his memory that way. Um, well, I, I'm afraid we're just about out of time, but I'd like to thank my guest, Jonathan Dio, for being on the podcast. And, and Jonathan, just thank you for um, you know, just being so vulnerable and and opening up about um, what you're going through. We really appreciate that. Thanks for having me, Diane. I appreciate it. And if you'd like to reach out to Jonathan, if you have questions for him, uh, just feedback, you can reach him at jonathan at mindful.money. And if you have a struggle, uh, you wish to share your experiences and help others in similar situations, please feel free to reach out to me at diana.britton at informa.com. I'd like to thank you for listening to the Healthy Advisor podcast. If you've not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This is Diana Britton reminding you that where there's healing, there is hope. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Healthy Advisor, a podcast focused on advisors' personal well-being and healing. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of wealthmanagement.com. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional advice. Always seek the advice of your healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding your particular situation.